Greetings again in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We are continuing in session number two or part number two of this lesson series where we are looking at withdrawal of fellowship. We saw in the last uh, session or session one or, or part one of this lesson series that withdrawal of fellowship is commanded by God. We also were able to see the definitions and understand what withdrawal of fellowship is. We understood and learned that withdrawal of fellowship means to withdraw ourselves from partnership, communion uh, that we once had with brethren. And we also saw that withdrawal of fellowship is made to those who are sinning, who are willfully sinning, who do not want to repent. And we also saw that the meaning of withdrawal of fellowship includes marking, in other words, identifying and uh, 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 clearly naming the person. We saw several texts showing that even Paul named those who were doing wrong. Not only Paul, other writers like John, they showed uh, uh, that there are some brethren among us that we ought to withdraw ourselves uh, uh, from them. So we understood what marking means. It means to identify. It means to name those who are doing wrong. We also learned the other uh, important aspect of withdrawal of fellowship, that it means we have to have no company with those uh, who are willfully sinning, who do not want to repent. And we realized that uh, withdrawal of fellowship is an act of tough love, not hate, but tough love coming from God. We read several scriptures like Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7 to 11, and 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 6, which, which demonstrate that true love that comes from God does not uh, accept sin. And we realize that true love does have discipline, corrective discipline, and withdrawal of fellowship is part of a, a discipline to correct those who are not doing right in the eyes of the, of the Lord. Today, uh, in, in this hour, we are looking now at another uh, 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 section that we ought to analyze and understand because it's quite important for us to know these aspects of uh, fellowship and withdrawal of fellowship. Today, we are then looking at who should we withdraw fellowship from? We understand now what fellow, what fellowship is. How do we or, or or what do we mean when we say withdraw fellowship? Now we want to know who should we withdraw fellowship from. The Bible has demonstrated um, clear enough that we withdraw fellowship from sinning persons or sinning person in the church. So it can be either a a, a man or a female. Anyone who's a Christian uh, who has uh, sinned, clearly sinned, um, and does not want to repent, the Bible clearly shows that we ought to withdraw fellowship. So we withdraw fellowship from those who do not want to repent from their sins. We read in the previous uh, session or first session that Second Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 6 up to verse 15 clearly showed that those who walk disorderly or cause disharmony disruption to the work of the church uh, we ought to withdraw fellowship from so those who do not walk according to the word of god and we also need to note as well um, in matthew chapter 18 this is before uh, the the new kingdom of Christ was established while Christ was still on earth. He did teach about a withdrawal of fellowship and how the church ought to treat those who sin, who do not want to repent from their sins. When we read here in Matthew chapter 18, this section deals, it is quite important for us to understand this because this text has been abused and misused by those who do not want to obey the word of God. This text uh, is dealing with a private matter, 
um, where one brother has offended or has done an offense to another brother. This is only known by them, by the two of them, and including God. So we're not talking about here a doctrine that has been taught in the church or a known sin that is known by the public or known by the church. It's dealing with a private matter between two uh, individuals. So now the Bible clearly shows how we ought to treat such matters, right? So uh, it's not dealing when someone has taught what is wrong in the church. Be in the media, nowadays we have Facebook or be it uh, uh, in the church, this person doesn't want to repent or someone who has done a public sin that is known. So when we read here in Matthew chapter 18, we, we get to understand what, what our Lord taught regarding withdrawal of fellowship. Yes, it's between two individuals. You will see that uh, if such a person doesn't repent, what are the consequences? Because sin is a serious matter in the church. Sin separates man from God. If you read Ephesians chapter 2, verse uh, uh, 11, going to verse 15, Paul there demonstrated that sin separated us from God, especially we who are uh, Gentiles. We are far away from God, you know. So uh, sin does separate man from God. Even if you read uh, Isaiah chapter 59, verse 1 and 2, where Isaiah clearly showed that uh, the reason why God was not with the nation of Israel at that time is because they had sinned, you know. Sin separates man from God. Even from the beginning, when we read about uh, uh, Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 2 and 3, particularly in chapter 3, when they had sinned, there was separation. So when sin is there among the people, God is not there. So hence, therefore, God has put these measures regarding withdrawal of fellowship because it is a serious matter. When sin is among people, God is not there. And the ultimate destiny or the, the penalty of sin is death, you know. So we do not want to lose our fellowship uh, from God uh, and the love that he has shown from us. So we will read here from verse 15 up to uh, verse 17, Matthew 18 verse, from verse 15 to 17. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear you, take with you one or two or, or more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him uh, be to you like a heathen or a tax collector. So here, uh, our Lord dealing with issues of sin among people. Uh, this is an offense done by one brother to another. Uh, the Bible says, if such has happened to me, my brother or anyone who is in the church who has offended me, I should go directly to him. This matter is known, known by the two of us. So if he then, after I've shown him his error, does not want to repent, does not want to uh, correct his ways, uh, uh, if he refuses, then I must go and ask two or three people. This principle that we see here, especially when uh, uh, Jesus, uh, our Lord says here, uh, 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 by the word of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. In other words, uh, uh, for, for it to be true, for it to be uh, concrete evidence, we need two or three uh, witnesses to say, brother so-and-so, after being corrected, did not want to to, to correct his ways, did not want to repent. So when we have such two people, it becomes um, evidence enough to show that this person doesn't want to repent. Enough proof. So uh, if then this person does not want to hear these two or three brethren who are trying to correct such a person, the church must be notified. Why? Because such sin is existing in the church. Such sin is done by this person. It's an, it is an offense to God. It cannot just be let go like that because such sin uh, separates God 
with such a person, you know. So tear to the church. But if the church refuses, if this person does not want to hear the church, then the church must treat this person as a heathen. In other words, it must treat this person as if he's a not is he's a non-believer. He's a is a not not a Christian. So the treatment is not the same. So there's there's a, there, there's been a change in relationship in in relations between this person and the church. So the whole church gets involved, and they they stop such fellowship from this person. So we clearly see that here. Any sinning person, whether they offend another person known by these two people, and such person doesn't want to repent, it even goes to the church, and this person doesn't want to repent, the church uh, is ordained or is commanded by God. We hear here through Christ that we ought not to continue our fellowship. So we treat this person as if he's a non-believer. We read as well in Romans 16 verse 17, uh, 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 it is important we also read Second John chapter nine, verse uh, eleven. Second uh, uh, John nine, uh, verse eleven, uh, verse nine to eleven. We see another category of people, right? So we saw that the first category is those who walk disorderly. Second Thessalonians three, verse six to fifteen. Those who walk dis- they walk contrary to the word of God. And then we read in Matthew 18, verse 15 to 17, one who sins, who commits sins against his brother and does not want to repent. So the church was involved, but this person does not want to repent. Now we see another type or another, another cause for us to withdraw fellowship from one person or, 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 or in, in the church. So we read here that uh, 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 those who, are, who cause divisions, they cause divisions in what way? They teach false doctrine. They teach what is contrary to the word. They cause disassociation. They cause uh, 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 us not to listen to God, us not obeying the true gospel of Christ. We end up now listening to his teachings, man-made teachings. right? So when you read here in Second John, um, the apostle here is also showing us that we need to take heed, you know, especially to those who teach what is contrary to the word of God. Just because a person smiles, uh, uh, doesn't, does, doesn't swear at us, uses sweet words, uh, charming words, it doesn't mean we ought to continue fellowshipping with that person. If he's teaching what is wrong, we ought not to continue fellowship. And you'll see in this text how serious it is, you know. Second John 9 to 11. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. Who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. So, what, what Apostle Paul, John here is showing us is that he who trans- transgresses, in other words, who does not abide in the doctrine of Christ, in a teaching that is taught by Christ. So we are referring to the whole New Testament, the whole doctrine that came from Christ. Remember when we, uh, 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 we learned in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to, to, to 20, uh, Jesus that tells his apostle that he's been given all authority in heaven and on earth. And he tells them to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in them in the name of our Lord, in the name of our Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And in verse 20, he clearly states that, that teach them to obey all that I have taught you. So whatever we read that comes from apostles, it, it's actually coming from Christ. It's the doctrine of Christ. It's what the teaching is about from Christ. So anyone, therefore, who transgresses, who disobeys, who does not abide in the doctrine of Christ, who teaches what is contrary to the doctrine of Christ, we, ha- we ought not to have fellowship with them. So what John is saying here is that that person does not have God. Do you realize how serious it is? You know, we have these charming people in the world. 
They teach so many doctrines that you are not found in the Bible. Doctrines that are contrary in the Bible. Even in the church, there are those who teach what is wrong. But yet, we continue fellowshipping with them. And the Bible says, God does not have them. God is not in fellowship with them. Because they are teaching what is contrary. And it further says, if anyone therefore who teaches what is contrary to the word of God, do not receive. It's a command. Do not receive such a person. It's even, you know, heartbreaking to see many of the leaders, especially elders, inviting false teachers in the church, supporting false teachers, those who have been marked, those who teach what is contrary to the word of God. They go and support those people. And they claim and they say, no, 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 uh, I'm not teaching that doctrine. It's his opinion. You know, but this person is teaching what is wrong. But you are continuously having fellowship. We are having joint partnership. We are, you are having communion. You know, when I go and support a, a lectureship and I teach in a lectureship or I, I, I partake in, in the work of a church where a false teacher is teaching there, day in and day out in the pulpit, and I'm saying, no, 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 it's his opinion. You know, it's contrary to what the Bible is teaching. The Bible says, do not welcome him. It's saddening to see many of the leaders in the church allowing false teachers to continue in the congregations teaching what is wrong. And they claim and they use such excuses. It's his own opinion. I know I'm right with God. You know, when you accept, when you fellowship such a person, when you continue to have partnership with this person, you are sinning in the eyes of the Lord. The Bible says, do not receive him, even in your houses. You know, he who does that, in verse 11, who, who greets him, shares. So the idea is to, hear yeah, the, the idea, greeting here, is to welcome you know, same as you welcome your brother, the one that you are in fellowship. So if you act the same way, but you know that this person is teaching wrong, you are sinning in the eyes of the Lord. So he who greets him or who fellowships him, who welcomes him, shares in his evil deeds. So they are partaking. You know, some deny that, you know, I can partake the sin of the other. The Bible is clear enough. If I allow what is wrong, if I allow in the church what is wrong, I am sharing the wrongdoing. I am also supporting the wrongdoing. I may say with my mouth, no, no, no. You know, I don't teach the same things that he teach, but I continue to be in fellowship with him. It is really disheartening to see the leaders doing such things. They do not obey the word of God. The word of God says, stop the fellowship. Do not welcome such a person. This person who teaches false doctrine does not have God. So we see here that we withdraw fellowship from false teachers. You know, false teachers, those who teach doctrine contrary to the word of God. Now, the other list of people that we ought to remember you know, what Paul has, has said in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 11, you will see a list of the type of people that we withdraw fellowship from. You know, clearly it seems that God is against with. So when we withdraw a person, it must be demonstrated, it must be shown through scripture. We just don't feel, withdraw fellowship because I don't like this person. You know, we withdraw fellowship on the grounds that this person has done Con what is contrary to the word of God? He has sinned. It must be demonstrated. There must be evidence for that. You know, withdrawing fellowship based on opinions or how I feel is not supported by the word of God. In fact, when I do that, I'm sinning in the eyes of God. You know, so it must be demonstrated that such a person has committed such sin. So the Bible says, if there's anyone who's named the brother, if we read here in 1 Corinthians, uh, they do such things, we we'll read here, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, verse 11, uh, 
But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral. So in other words, someone who fornicate, someone who, 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 who lives in adult, someone who commits adult, you know, you sleep with another person uh, uh, outside of marriage. You sleep with another person and you, you've been warned to stop such a sin. You don't stop. The Bible says we withdraw fellowship from such people. It also mentions here yeah, uh, covetous. In other words, people who are, who are covert, you know, who, 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 who misuses money, you know, who, 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 who are not careful on how they use money, you know, in the church, who steal money from the church, you know. And anyone who, who is an uh, uh, idolater, in other words, a person who worships false gods, like Hamad Luz, and does not want to stop that, we withdraw fellowship from, from such a person. A drunkard, you know, a, a, an extortioner, someone who steals, someone who takes things from other people. These type of sins, the Bible has given a list of those things that we ought, if we see just a person in the church, we withdraw fellowship from. It cannot be uh, 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 as usual, everything is normal, but there are people who are doing wrong. Now, we, we saw that we withdraw from a sinning person in the church. Another type of uh, grouping that we withdraw fellowship from uh, uh, is from congregations that have apostatized. Congregation that have left their first faith, the congregations that no longer teach the truth, congregations that no longer abide in the doctrine of Christ, we withdraw fellowship from those. You know, it has been asked that can a congregation withdraw fellowship from sister congregations who have apostatized? Is there biblical authority for such an action? It should be noted as well that there is fellowship among uh, congregations. When you read the New Testament, you will see that Paul was working with different, different congregations. Wherever he, he, he preaches the, the gospel, when the brethren meet in that particular area, they are a church of Christ. So in all these areas, these brethren had common fellowship. You will see this in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9, you'll see that when there was famine in Judea, all the congregations put together money and they said they were sent to Judea to assist the people there because there was famine. So the brethren were working together, were in fellowship. So we note that in the tournament, congregations were in fellowship. They worked together. They participated in missionary works. When Paul was preaching the gospel, various congregations were supporting him. If you read Ephesians chapter 4, you, sorry, Philippians chapter 4, you will note there that Paul shows us that the brethren in Philippi supported him when he started his work. In other words, the congregations were in fellowship. They were working together. You read there in, in Acts chapter 15, when the church in Jerusalem was dealing with a problem among the Gentiles, that there were some who were teaching false doctrines that each and every one of us who is a Gentile must first be circumcised before they become Christians. Such doctrine did not come from the apostles, did not come from God. So when the brethren in Jerusalem especially the apostles and the elders, those who knew the word of God, those who, who understood what Christ uh, required of, of the church, especially the apostles, they wrote letters to, to the Gentile congregations. This demonstrated that the church was, or the congregations were in fellowship with one another. So therefore, it is authorized, it is biblical, uh, it is taught by the word of God that congregations can have fellowship, can have uh, combined services, can have can share resources to preach the gospel, can support preachers. That is fellowship. That is joint partnership, as per definition. The Bible defines, uh, or the the the, the 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 New Testament shows a fellowship as joint participation, fellowship. 
partnering communion so congregations were in fellowship our question therefore since uh, there is an existing fellowship that came together because these congregations share one lord which is jesus, jesus christ obey one lord obey one law if it then happens one of the congregations does not want to or does not want to continue in the doctrine of Christ, have allowed false teachers, have, 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 have brethren who live in sin, nothing is done to correct such, such, such a, 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 a wrongdoing in the church. What do other congregations do? Must they just fold their arms and say, listen, uh, 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 there's no verse that says we ought not to, uh, uh, or we ought to stop fellowship? Should they behave in that such manner? You know? Admittedly, there are no direct uh, or explicit commands, no examples in the New Testament where one congregation withdraws fellowship from another. But because there's no direct or explicit uh, 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 verse, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is not authorized. We know that the word of God uh, or God authorizes in three ways. One, in other words, an action or what we ought to do or not to do, he then does it in three ways. One, he does it through direct commands or explicit commands. For an example, do not murder, do not steal. Those are direct commands, right? And also God uh, demonstrates his law through examples or apostolic examples when you look at the New Testament. For an example, there's no text in the Bible where it commands the church that they should meet every first day of the week to partake of the Lord's Supper. There's no verse that directly says that. But there is an example, an apostolic example, when you read Acts 20 verse 7, we see that the church came together on the first day of the week and the reason for that was to partake of the Lord's Supper. But it's not directly stated. And thirdly, we know that the, the Word of God does uh, 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 authorize through uh, implicit uh, commands, or in other words, not indirect commands. So it's not stated directly that you ought to do this or not to do this. Right? So there are many examples to demonstrate this, that the Bible does teach indirectly. For an example, a congregation uh, uh, builds a, a church building. There's no verse that commands a church to build a, 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 a a church building, but it is commanded or it is shown or it is allowed or it is authorized, if I may use that word, through inter indirect means. When you read, uh, uh, for an example, uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, where it says we should not forsake uh, assemblies, you know. So if we then need to assembly, it implies or we can infer that there is a building, there is a meeting area, you know. So the Bible therefore uh, authorizes actions either indirectly or directly or examples. Three ways. Where we have none of those, those uh, uh, three items, therefore we're not authorized. The other way that is being used that is that the, the Bible is silent. So there's no example, there's no indirect commands. You know, there's no example. So, therefore, we're not authorized to do such an action. So, it's not a purpose of this study to show, to show uh, 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 demonstrate these three items that are spoken of, but it is clearly, it needs to be clearly understood that the, the Bible does authorize through indirect means, indirect commands. In other words, we deduce from the statement made by the word of God through a, 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 a text that we've been given. So, we, we, for an example, we know in as much as there are no direct or explicit commands for necessary uh, inference or implicit commands that the Lord's Supper must be taken uh, only on Sunday based only on one approved apostolic example, which is Acts 20 verse 7. So we know that we get authority even from one text. We don't need the whole Bible to demonstrate one thing that is commanded by God. Since we have read Romans 16 verse 17, which uh, warns us not to have 
fellowship with those who teach uh, what is wrong. And 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 16 and Ephesians 5 verse 11, which instru instructs us to withdraw fellowship, fellowship from more than one erring person. So when you read this text, it's talking about persons, people, not necessarily one person. So uh, since the church is contributed by more than two persons, when you read Matthew 18 verse 20, Jesus says that if there are uh, two or three gathered in my name, lo, I'm with them. So in other words, a church is constituted to be a church when there are more than two people congregating. That is a church. So it's not uh, directly stated, but it is implied that it is a church. Right? So we see, therefore, that fellowship is withdrawn from more than one person. One cannot say, uh, if there are two people who are sinning in the church, we ought to withdraw only from one. That does not make sense. You know, the Bible has shown that uh, as a principle that anything or anyone, if, in fact, if you read Ephesians 5 verse 11, anything that is the works of darkness, it may be one person, it may be thousand people, it may be things, we ought not to have fellowship with such things or such people or such persons. So it will be a, 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 a foolish of us to say you can withdraw fellowship from one person, but if there are more than two of such people who act in a wrong way, we ought not to withdraw from them. It does not make sense. So uh, it is necessary to infer that we are to withdraw fellowship from anyone, including a church, who are erring. The Bible does not only authorize by direct commands and examples only, but by implications, impl implications as well. So if we see there in Matthew 22, verse 29 to 31, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 27, Romans 10, verse 13 to 14, these texts uh, and others demonstrate that the Bible does uh, 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 command in an implicit way in an indirect way. Failure to withdraw fellowship from, a co from congregations who are in error means there is no biblical basis for us to have fellowship with denominations. If it is incorrect of us to withdraw fellowship from one church who is sinning or one congregation, we have no biblical basis not to fellowship any denomination. Therefore, we have no biblical, biblical basis not to fellowship the Roman Catholic Church. We have no biblical basis for not fellowship Pentecostal churches or any other groupings out there that says it's coming from God. We cannot deny, we cannot say we cannot fellowship with them. Because if we say we cannot fellowship with them, we must demonstrate where in the Bible it's coming from. You see, many of our brethren have made such uh, uh, foolish statements, unwise statements, that there's no, there's no verse that says we ought to withdraw fellowship from the whole church. They even say, because there are innocent brethren out there. Brethren, if I know that brother so-and-so is teaching error and I've been made aware, a uh, uh, brethren have notified me and there's enough evidence, I cannot say I do not know. I cannot say I'm innocent. When I fellowship someone who is in error, I am not innocent. The Bible says I should not even welcome him in my house. 2 John verse 10 to 11. A person who teaches what is wrong, a person who misbehaves, a person who does not repent, I, even as a woman, a woman in the church, I cannot say I, no one can say I'm innocent if I know such a person is teaching wrong and I'm welcoming this person. I'm going to a, a congregation and sitting and listening to this false teacher. It cannot be true that I'm innocent. I'm not innocent in the eyes of God because I know that this person is teaching wrong and I've been told and I've been taught by the word of God that I should not fellowship this person. I must withdraw myself. Now, if the whole congregation does not withdraw itself from a sinning person, it is sinning itself. 
It has partaken in the sins of this person. It may be one person, it may be two persons in the congregation who sins and the church decides to do nothing. It is sinning in the eyes of God. So therefore, there's no one here who is innocent. The only person who, whom we can say is innocent is the one who, who cannot hear like a baby, who cannot understand. You know, when you look at a toddler, that's a person who, who we say is innocent. But a person who willfully sins in the church is not innocent. A person who willfully fellowships a false teacher is not innocent. That person is sinning. So therefore, if we say we cannot withdraw fellowship from a congregation that was once working in the light, that was once teaching the truth, now is teaching error, and we continue fellowshipping that church, we have no biblical basis for not fellowshipping denominations. In fact, we ought, for those who teach such doctrine, they ought to walk in each and every building out there that has a church, that has God, that has Christ, and sit in there and listen to those false teachers. Yet our brethren, some of our brethren who teach such wrong things, they, they insist that the church must partake in sin. Denom denominations are not in fellowship, including congregations who once had the name of Christ, who once were working in, with Christ. Uh, and by the way, denominations come from the church. The first denomination, which is uh, the Roman Catholic Church, come from the Church of Christ. They are a breakaway because they were teaching wrong things. So if we then say we cannot withdraw fellowship from another congregation that is teaching error, we ought to fellowship the Roman Catholic Church. So denominations are not in fellowship with God. So are apostate congregations who do not repent. Revelation 2, verse 5, 3, verse 16, Matthew 15, verse 13. All these verse demonstrate that those who do not want to repent, including the whole, whole congregation, even Christ says there, I will not continue fellowshipping with you. I will not continue be with you if you do not repent. He's talking to congregations. So if Christ can withdraw from a church because they are working in error, and I, or as brethren outside that congregation, we continue fellowshipping with them, what does that mean? What does that say to God? God has withdrawn himself from such congregations because they teach wrong or they act in a wrong way. But I continue fellowshipping with them. It means I've become now what? An enemy with God because I'm no longer in partnership with God. Remember, we are partners with God. I obey what God says. So if I do that, I am in partnership. I'm in fellowship with God. It has been asked as well that what about those who are innocent in a congregation that is in error? I've already demonstrated that those who do not practice uh, the error must withdraw their fellowship or leave the said congregation following their attempt to correct those in error with a set congregation. You can read Revelations 18, verse 4, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 17 to 18, Revelations chapter 2, verse 14 to 16, and verse 24, 26. The, the, these people, they were required to repent, right? From allowing apostates in the church. Revelations 18, verse 4, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 17 to 18, at Revelation 2, verse 14 to 16, and 24 to 26, the, the, some of these congregations were being rebuked by Christ. What was the problem? They allowed false teachers. Christ was correcting them. You know, a lot of people go into Revelation, special chapter 2 and 3, and they say, see Christ, he did not withdraw fellowship. You know? Christ was warning them. He was trying to correct them. So, the, the withdrawal of fellowship happens when we have attempted, have tried many times to correct this person and this, our correction fails. It is then when we withdraw fellowship. So at, at this particular time, Christ was warning the congregation, fix these things, correct these things. If you don't correct them, I, am, I will no longer be with you. So withdrawal of, of fellowship was coming if they did not 
correct their ways. So one of the problems in this congregation is that they allowed false teachers. So it is sinful to sit at the feet of a false teacher. You are not innocent. Failure to withdraw fellowship for face the innocence as, it's, as it is supporting and fellowship a sinning persons. If you read there, 2 John 11, we saw when we read that text, that he who welcomes him, he who shares with this person, shares in their sin, right? Corinthians 5, verse 11 to, uh, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 11, 9 to 11, it shows there that we ought not to fellowship these people. Because if we do so, we read there in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 6 and 7, that we are sharing in their sin. This is, by the way, guilt, guilt, guilt by association. If you read as well, Numbers 16, verse 26. So we have learned today that the Bible has taught us that uh, which type of people uh, we ought to withdraw fellowship from. We learned that we ought to withdraw fellowship from those who are sinning in the church. They sin by how? One, they walk disorderly, not in harmony with the word of in harmony with the word of God. Second Thessalonians three, verse sixteen to fifteen. We withdraw those who have done or committed offenses to their brethren and have been warned by the church, but they do not want to repent. We withdraw fellowship. We withdraw fellowship from those who teach false doctrine, who teach what is contrary to the word of God. We learn in Second John nine that those who teach such false doctrines do not have God. Do not, do not have crisis. So hence, therefore, we, we ought to withdraw ourselves. We also learned in verse 11 that if we fellowship with them, if we welcome them, if we participate in their activities, we are sinning. Right? This is not the same as going to a shopping center with a sinner or with a false teacher or with a known person. We are going there to shop. But if I'm going into participating in their worship service, I'm participating in their uh, 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 missionary com campaign or evangelism co campaign. I'm supporting them on Facebook. I'm lifting them up in their wrongdoing. That is fellowship. We are talking about that. So we have leaders in the church who will go into lectureship, knowing very well, into uh, gatherings of the church, knowing very well that there's a false teacher. And they sit there and they think they are the innocent. They are not innocent. So we learned that it is the person who sins. We also learned that uh, we withdraw fellowship even to uh, 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 congregations that have apostatized. We noted that the Bible does as well uh, teach um, implicitly uh, or indirectly if there's any wrongdoing. We noted that uh, the books, Romans 16, verse 17, 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 16, Ephesians 5, verse 11, instructs us to withdraw fellowship not only from one person, from more than one, because it says from brethren. So it can be one person, it can be thousands of people, so long as they are doing wrong. And we noted that the church is doing wrong, is sinning when it's fellowshipping with, with a, a false teacher or with someone who doesn't want, want to repent. Therefore, no one in that congregation is innocent. Those who've been baptized, and by the way, the people that are being baptized are those who can discern between wrong and right, who know what is right, who know what is wrong. So anyone who's a Christian who continues fellowshipping someone who is sinning is by themselves sinning. So it is implied. So the church is sinning because it, it is shown in Scripture because they've continuously uh, supported and, and fellowshiped a wrong person, a sinning person. So we, we noted that we even withdraw from a congregation that is uh, associating or fellowshipping or partnering with false teachers. I hope today you have learned a lot from the Word of God. We'll continue another session where we will be looking now at when should fellowship be withdrawn. May the Lord bless you in this wonderful day. Uh, amen.